You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed, and I'm honored to have as guests with me for the next two hours, Timothy Alberino of Genesis 6 Productions. Timothy, are you there, brother? I am, Zen. Delighted to be with you. Uh, it's a great privilege. Uh, thank you for making yourself uh, open and willing and um, looking forward the, to the discussion over the next two hours. But I did want to, and the reason why I read that particular passage is because of uh, the premise of the uh, Unholy Sea, the second in the documentary series uh, that you and Steve Quell and others have been working on. And um, as I said in response to you when you sent me the, the link to it, I could only wish that the whole world would be able to watch this in the movie theaters and what kind of a, a mind shift it would transform and cause in the public consciousness if um, people would just, you know, actually go out there and watch it. It's a fantastic documentary. And it shows that there was a, a previous antediluvian age that was ruled over by these fallen ones and that they were composing and constructing in megalithic fashion, which still remains unexplainable according to science as of today. And so if you would, can you speak about the documentary, where people can go to find it, and also how they can support you and your work and um, your various YouTube channels and et cetera? The, the film The Unholy Sea is, is the second episode, the second installment in our True Legends documentary film series, uh, people can find the links to the various, um, to the various uh, uh, modes of our film on truelegendstheseries.com. They can buy the DVD, they can buy the uh, Blu-ray, and also we offer unlimited streaming via Vimeo. So, and thank you for those, uh, those kind words about the film. I, I think that there is a lot of misconceptions out there concerning what I refer to as the prehistoric past, meaning the antediluvian world. And um, I do believe that our film has helped to shed, at least uh, to, to shed a little bit more light on, on the dynamics that were involved. Absolutely. And for I know a lot of people they deny and they believe that uh, the entirety of the Genesis timeline, that it only comprises the last 6,000 years of modern history. But as I show and as we quoted um, from Peter, he, it's clear that he speaks of a world that was then uh, and is different than what is currently as far as the generations of the heaven and the earth. And so, in my mind, also, when you look up in detail the, the Strong's Concordance, the references with uh, Genesis 1-2, where it speaks the earth having become without form and void, that the Most High created the earth, as it says in Isaiah, to be inhabited, and also he created it perfect. And yet something led to it having become uh, a deserted wasteland and an indistinguishable ruin as it references in the Strong's Concordant definitions of those words, tohu wa vohu. And so it seems clear to me that there was this previous age and that judgment was brought upon the fallen ones um, and that they were here even before we were, as is most certainly elaborated on in detail in the premise and also all the travel um, that you did in showing the cyclopean megaliths from Malta and, and other places. So 
if you would, can you speak about your travels? And uh, I know that had just to be an incredible experience for you in going to those sites and, and being witness uh, directly in their presence. Well, we wanted to visit some of the most monumental sites where megaliths can be found, uh, at least in the places that are that are safe to travel in at this point in time. A lot of the most amazing places such as Baalbek and Lebanon are at this point uh, too close to the activity of ISIS to go to. But we went to South America. We went to, uh, we went to the island of Malta. We went to the island of Sardinia. We went to the, we went to Rome, to the Vatican. And uh, we, again, we explored some of the most dynamic megaliths in those regions, and we found that there is a very distinct correlation between all of the megaliths. You mentioned the term cyclopean, um, the the cyclopean masonry, which is which is a word that that comes to us from the from the Greeks, from the ancient Greeks, who actually uh, credited the cyclops, the mythical cyc uh, the mythical cyclops giant, with the construction. Of what they refer to as cyclopean cyclopean edifices, which which are edifices constructed with stones without the use of mortar, very large stones in in, in most cases. So we wanted to we wanted to go to uh, get an up close perspective on what we believe are the ruins of the world before the flood of Noah, because the world before the flood of Noah is so misunderstood as i said earlier it's there are a lot of misconceptions concerning that time in the biblical context in the sense that a lot of people and myself included have been inundated with the notion have been inculcated with the notion that that the the world before the flood of noah was a time of simpletons on the earth was a time where basically it just it just looked like a, a primitive world in which in which men were do, beginning to do bad things that made God angry, and, and so angry, in fact, that he, that he sent a deluge and destroyed all life on the planet, when in fact the reality, the, the intricacies of what was taking place during that epoch of time are, are almost inconceivable and are absolutely not only relevant, but are the key to unlocking. Is it, it, it provides us with the keys to unlocking much of the prophetic context of the Bible concerning what is coming in the future. So we knew that we had to not just talk about giants, not just talk about fallen angels, but go and document, really document the only remains, the only evidence that remains on the earth that we can actually have access to, that we can get to, um, from the pre-flood world, and that is the Cyclopean edifices, the ruins of the Cyclopean edifices. As much as archaeologists, conventional archaeologists and scientists would like to, and historians would like to negate the flood of Noah, there is an app there's absolutely overwhelming evidence overwhelming there is a pun intended a deluge of evidence concerning the flood of noah i mean it happened and it didn't just happen in a local regional sense it happened on a global scale because if you go to puno if you go to the i'm sorry if you go to the um to the altiplano of peru and bolivia near the city of puno and you you look at the ruins of of um puma punku in Bolivia, you find that the ruins are showing evidences that they were submerged in water. In fact, that they were uh, torn to, to pieces, ripped apart, uh, disheveled by by a flood, by very violent uh, uh, activity of water. And it wasn't a, a local flood; it was a it was a global flood. Because if you go to the other side of the earth and you go to Malta, you find the same evidence. Everything was at one time submerged beneath the waves of the ocean. If you go to the island of Sardinia, which is still in the Mediterranean, the western Mediterranean, you find the exact same evidence. In fact, all over the earth, if you go to Baalbek, or even if you go to the far reaches of Siberia, you're going to find seashells. You're going to find, um, you're going to find the, uh, the, the residue of creatures from the sea 
the crustaceans and so forth that have been preserved in the form of fossils, even on top of mountains. I mean, the flood, the, the flood of Noah uh, is, is a fact. It was recorded in this event. This great flood was recorded in the, in the annals of, of many different high civilizations, ancient high civilizations on the earth, and in, in fact, in almost every ancient high civilization, primary civilization on the earth, along with the narrative of very powerful beings that descended from the heavens and their offspring that happened to be giants in almost every case, uh, a variety of different kinds of hybrid giants, but giants nonetheless in every case. So in almost every case, I should say. So uh, the theme is persistent. It's prevalent across the globe. And uh, so you start with the reality that the flood existed, okay? As Bible-believing Christians, we, we, we can accept quite easily, in fact, it doesn't take much faith to accept the fact that the flood occurred. Then you have to ask the important question. The important question is, why did the flood occur? Is God so fickle that, that mere... Uh, uh, that naughty behavior, let's say, let's put it in very nice terms, can result in the annihilation of not only uh, almost the almost total annihilation of not only the human species, but every other kind of living thing on the earth. Um, we know that it is much more than just your run-of-the-mill bad behavior. We know that there was something very unique happening in the pre-flood world that caused God to... Uh, reset to reinitiate life on the planet, and in fact, um, it was not only an act of judgment; it was an act of logic on God's part that He would reset the genomes of the creatures that He had created, that He had made, because there were there were um, unsanctioned creatures that had been created through the through miscegenation, through the illicit activity of the fallen watchers. And we're not just talking about for a month or a year or a few years. We're talking about over a thousand years, over a thousand years uh, of the history of this planet was a time when the angels were involved in miscegenation, which is the, the mixing of of the genomes of different kinds of creatures, and uh, which was which was strictly forbidden by God. Each kind was to reproduce after its kind, and so. Um, there was this monumental mess, this genetic chaos that ensued on the planet in which every, all flesh, the Bible says, had corrupted its way on the earth. All flesh was corrupt. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the words that are involved in that language, you begin to realize that we're dealing with a very, a, a genetic corruption, a corruption on the genomic level, uh, and so there are many intricate pieces and parts to the pre-flood world that involve all kinds of sordid characters, not only the fallen angels, not only the watchers, as they're called in many of the, the ancient documents, uh, extra-biblical documents, including the Bible and the book of Daniel. But uh, you also have, which we discussed in a previous uh, in, in a previous conversation, you also have the strange activity that was happening in the line of Cain without yes. the advent of the Watchers. I mean, even if the Watchers had not descended to the earth, you still have to deal with this strange situation revolving around Cain and his descendants. Then you throw in the Watchers on top of it, which I think you and I agreed last time we were talking that Cain probably and his descendants probably had something to do with with the with the descent of the watchers and 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 then you add in Enoch who is called the scribe of righteousness into the mix of all of this and and his dealings with not only the the watchers but all and the giants but also with the the hosts of heaven that were still loyal to the father and the father himself and and, and you have what you have is an epic you have a story, a legend, if you will, that happens to be true, that is is far more interesting, fascinating than any other story that we could possibly concoct 
in, in with our own imagination. So it, it really is a fascinating topic. And, and, and what's really exciting, Zen, is that the evidence that this really happened, that what I just laid out is, in fact, a fact, a scientific fact. The evidence is there. It still exists, not only in the form of the megaliths, um, but in some other ways as well. Yes, that is the most amazing aspect of all of the mythology and the way that it unites with the biblical narrative is that it most certainly is true. And the strange esoteric aspects of what the Bible speaks about with regard to the fallen angels, the fallen watchers, the Nakash, the, these dragon-like entities and the presence of them, and the giants, the children born of the watchers, all of that and the way that it all ties together uh, with what we see in the archaeological, anthropological record um, and the mythologies that most people thought were just childhood fantasy or fairy tale, it all is coming to light and is being affirmed with individuals like yourself, documentaries which you have been producing. Um, all over the world, the mythologies and the archaeological evidence, the these megalithic, even ancient cities being found at the bottoms of the oceans at a time when humanity was supposedly less than hunter and gatherers and was not yet even declared to be on the scene as far as in modern form. And yet we have these ancient megalithic sites with huge temple complexes built all over the world in similar pyramidal fashion and um, and science has no explanation for it, which leads me to, I wanted to have you comment on the name of uh, America and how it ties to the land of the feathered serpent in which we see the ancient pagan religions worldwide, how they all revered the feathered serpent. And this all is, in my opinion, also connected to Genesis 3, the beguilement of Eve, and as you said, the strange nature of the line of Cain, which also ties together with the New World Order, the elites, the fascination, the worship of Lucifer, as this also feathered serpent dragon-like entity. The, uh, the name... America seems to have its roots, according, by the way, to Manly P. Hall, who was um, another cultist, but Manly P. Hall, who was one of the most renowned philosophers of the of the Masons of the Masonic Order, of the various Masonic Orders, uh, believe that the, the 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 word America derives from the uh, from the um, pre-Columbian natives. Of, of Central and South America. We know that both in Central America and South America, the term Amaru, especially in Peru, I know that for a fact because it's, it's, it's still this way today among, in the Quechua language, Amaru means serpent or dragon. And in and Ka, C-A, Amaru Ka means the land. Ka means the land of. So so you have a maruka, meaning the land of the serpent or the land of the, the dragon. And, and specifically, there's an indication that it's referencing the feathered serpent. So the term a maruka, which was a term that the, that, the, that the natives used, again, both in Central and South America, to describe the Americas, was in general to describe the Americas, was a word that meant land of the plumed serpent, or land of the feathered serpent, or perhaps even just land of the serpent. We know also that the, the natives, the indigenous peoples of both South America, of Central America, and also the natives of North America, uh, all had this very mystical perception of the serpent, and the feathered serpent, and the serpent and serpentine entities play into their myths and legend quite often. So um, there is this, this very interesting connection between the, uh, the cult mysteries of the, 
the occult mysteries of the of the Inca and of the Maya and and of the Aztec and of some of the North American natives uh, concerning the serpent, concerning the serpentine beings that came and taught their people civilization. Well, this is a this is a a very interesting legend because you find that this legend reoccurs just like the flood, just like the the offspring, the the gods descending from heaven, their hybrid giant offspring. Um, this is one of those legends that you can find reoccurrent all over the earth, and it and it involves these serpentine-like creatures. Some of the legends reference these creatures as being uh, entities that uh, a race of serpentine entities that 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 abide in the in the inner earth, below the surface of the earth. Other legends talk about these entities coming through portals, showing up through what we might call stargates. Other Legends talk about these entities coming from over the sea on boats or rafts or, or, or descending from the heavens. So you have you have this feathered serpent creature showing up all over the place, especially in the Americas. And uh, there seems to be a correlation, at least again, Manly P. Hall believed that there was a correlation. The only, ref the only re reason I would reference Manly P. Hall is to demonstrate that the occult the 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 the, mer the world of the mysteries of the the adepts of the mystery schools in many cases uh, and in I would say in most cases have a better understanding of history than scientists than the historians than the archaeologists because their history their traditions the the traditions of the occultists go back um, further they go back. Um, in fact, all the way to the pre-flood time. So, uh, but that is in no way a, an endorsement of the occult because we have we have a better record, and it is the the story, the narrative that is contained in the Bible is a truer, is a better record. In fact, the occult record is oftentimes a narrative that comes from the rebels. It is a narrative. Uh, a perspective that comes from from the fallen angels and from the rebels, the enemies of God. And so they don't deny that the Bible is true. They just take an opposing view uh, to the to the God of the Bible and, and to the truths uh, that are deliberated therein. So uh, Amaruka, the land of the plumed serpent, it seems that the United States, uh, which is which was uh, which was destined to become, the New Atlantis was was named after the the land of the plumed serpent, or, or or was named in accordance with what the uh, what the Native Americans themselves called their land, which was the land of the serpent or the land of the plumed serpent, Amaru Ka, and there are different variations of it. So obviously, if you um, if you uh, uh, Spaniardize the, the the word Amaruka, or if you put it into a a more an English phonetics, you can easily derive America from Amaruka. And of course, we learn in school that America was named after Amerigo Vespucci, and there are a number of reasons why that is probably not the case. Um, um, but it's very interesting when you think about the destiny of America, when you think about what the the mystery adepts believe about America, when you take a look at Francis Bacon and the Rosicrucians and the New Atlantis, um, there is there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of indication that there are many out there who believe that America is in fact and always has been Amaruka the land of the serpent or the land of the plume serpent referencing referencing specifically these these beings by the way we're not just talking about regular snakes the snake is symbolic of of these entities these serpentine creatures that are sentient and uh, you'll find that you'll find that that symbolism connected to these creatures all over the earth yes um and it also seems to be linked to how here we have the eagle as representative of America, but that seems to be tied to an even ancient, more iconic symbology and, and connected to the also the two-headed um, eagle of the Roman Empire. And 
I have discovered that it is also connected to the phoenix, which the phoenix is said to have been one of these feathered basilisks. So in the same kind of thing, the dragon as a feathered serpent, um, a winged serpent, reptilian type of dragon-like entity. And so it seems even that iconography is all linked in similarity to what we are speaking about. Yes, and it's important to understand when considering the United States, when considering the destiny of the United States or the occult destiny of the United States, that there's always been a dichotomy here in this land, a dichotomy that began long ago with the colonization scheme under Francis Bacon, because it was Francis Bacon who initiated and directed, certainly directed, managed the colonization scheme. Um, when the pilgrims were coming over who were Puritans, at the same time, after they arrived, shortly after they arrived, Francis Bacon began to seek to sow in, into the United States um, the uh, different uh, secret me. societies. All right, we'll be right back. We'll pick it up on the other side. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Timothy, I want to give you a chance to finish up your thought, and then I'll bring up another um Are you there, brother? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, yeah, I was talking about the dichotomy that exists in the United States that has existed from the beginning because uh, when the United States began to be colonized, the of course, William Bradford came over on the Mayflower with the, with the, with the Puritans. They were Bible-believing Christians. Um, they, they rejected the Church of both Rome and the Church of England. They um, they they read the Geneva Bible and they came over for for religious freedom to be able to worship God um, in the tradition of the apostles. But at the same exact time, or shortly thereafter, Francis Bacon, who was in charge of the colonization scheme in 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 England at the time, began to very purposely send over to this land Rosicrucians, Masons, Kabbalists, m mystics, um, to seed them into the birth of the colonies. So that dichotomy has always existed uh, between the, the faction on the one hand that consists of Bible-believing Christians who are trying to live uh, in accordance with the scriptures and the tradition of the apostles, and then on the other hand, you have, uh, you have posers, you have occultists who pose as Christians. I mean, the, the Rosicrucians, that's the, their symbol is the Rosy Cross, and what the Rosy Cross represents is, it, the symbol is a cross with a, uh, with a, a rose superimposed on top of the cross, and what that represents is, um, is the mystery schools. Uh, it, basically, it represents Christianity that is uh, that is superimposed by the mysteries. It is a mixture of Christianity and the mysteries, the occult. And that is the dichotomy that's existed in this country. You have true, you've had true Bible-believing Christian, Christians since the beginning, whom, you know, the Puritans made a pact with God when they came over. They were certainly, um, they certainly endured many very difficult times uh, in the early days of the colonies. And made a covenant with God here in America, and I believe that God honored their covenant and that God blessed their work. But then at the at the same time, you had you had the mystery schools that were at work who were actively working to build a new Atlantis, a new occult empire, um, and and ultimately enthrone the great philosopher king. So. Um, that's the dichotomy that's existed in the United States for a very long time. So when we talk about, since the beginning, so when we talk about the United States being Amaru Ka, land of the plumed serpent, it's not a fatalistic view. It's not, it's not, I don't, I don't hold the perspective, I don't hold the view that the United States is absolutely destined to bring about the rise of the Antichrist or something like that. I believe that the United States has been locked and will be locked for some time into the future, locked in, in, in a battle between the traditional Bible-believing faction and the and the um, and the occult faction, and it's it, at this point in time, unfortunate, unfortunately, the the occult faction has definitely won over the culture. But um, 
but that that's a, that that's a whole different conversation. So I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. Yes, um, there's a question from the chat room. Well, first they said that also, with what we're speaking, uh, there's connection to the flying fiery serpent as well. And I'll um, bring something up that Solomon had said in connection to the strangeness of these particular beings. But um, it, they wanted to ask you if you saw this presence being also part of Nimrod and the Stargate, the Tower of Babel, and were they instructing them on that particular construction and what you thought about uh, its purpose? You mean the serpent, the serpentine entities? Yes. Uh huh. Well, I'll be honest with you. It, it's it's a confusing. The, these entities are these are this is a confusing situation, because we have we have three paradigms that are at work whenever we whenever we look behind us into the past, going all the way back to Adam and beyond. We have we have a pre-Adamic paradigm, which obviously would indicate the time before Adam the time before the human race showed up on the scene. We have a pre-flood paradigm, which would indicate the time from Adam to the flood of Noah. And we have a post-flood paradigm, speaking of the time from uh, when the waters of the flood receded to, to today, to this very moment. Uh, so when looking back, it, it's hard to place some of the different entities that we encounter that we encounter in the Bible, that we encounter in some of the extra-biblical texts, that we encounter in ufology, that we encounter in uh, abduction scenarios, even today. It's very difficult to place some of these creatures. It's, it, it, it is in some ways easy to place, for example, the giants. We know that the giants specifically had their origin in the advent of the Watchers. When the Watchers descended from heaven, and copulated with human women and were involved in the miscegenation of life on the earth. That's where the that's where the giants came from. There's no doubt. That was their origin. Their primal origin was from the Watchers. They were more of the Watchers than they were of the human women, according to the Book of Enoch. Nonetheless, they were hybrids, and we know that uh, many of their spirits still wander the earth today as unclean spirits. Those are the possessing spirits, the spirits that Jesus casted out with a word. Uh, on numerous occasions in the New Testament. Okay, so we can we can file the giants away. We know where they come from. We know where their origin, where they have their origin. I think in that category, we can also probably categorize the the uh, um, the the cy the cyclo the cyclopes, the uh, uh, the the fauns and the the satyrs and and the centaurs and the minotaurs and those those kinds of creatures that that come to us from Greek mythology not only Greek mythology Mesopotamian mythology as well we can probably take those creatures that are part of the Mesopotamian and Greek mythology mythology and file them away also um, into the advent of the watchers and the in the miscegenation so uh, so that takes care in my mind of a large swath of mythical creatures but but even after you've done that even after you settled that in your mind, you still have to deal with these serpentine entities, right? Yes. Uh, where do they come from? And right. and they seem to have their origins, from what I can tell. Uh, and this this is uh, I uh, it, it's I lean in this direction. Let's just put it that way. That that these and en these entities, these um, these. Um, uh, draconian creatures, whatever you want to call them, they're known by different names, uh, seem to me to have their origin in the world before Adam, in the pre-Adamic paradigm. Yes. They might have been here before Adam. They might be the residue of a time uh, before, before the human race. We encounter one of them in the garden, at least. Now, whether that was the devil himself or whether it or that maybe perhaps the devil is of this kind of thing. He, maybe he's the chief. Maybe he is their father. Maybe he seeded this particular kind of draconian race on the earth and perhaps an, in other places as well. Um, but one thing that I find very interesting about these entities is that many times, I would say, uh, in many circumstances, throughout uh, the legends and myths of many cultures, you find these entities associated with the underworld, with the, with the, with the, um, the the empire 
that exists under our feet, so to speak, the the hollow earth, if you will. And uh, certainly even in, 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 in modern times, and w anybody who's familiar with Nazi lore will be familiar with the Vril Society, will be familiar with the Vril Ya, uh, the book by Edward Lytton Bulwer, or I'm sorry, Edward Bulwer Lytton, uh, called The Coming Race, which describes this, this, this race uh, of, of, um, of draconian serpentine entities that live in the bowels of the earth. And, and it's called the coming race because uh, the occult world prophesies a time in which they will emerge from the bowels of the earth to govern the earth, to basically to take over the kingdoms of men and to rule over the kingdoms of men. And of course, we have this, the Nakash, uh, I, I believe they're called the Naga race in, um, in India, this, this serpentine race of entities that lives beneath the ground. So... Um, I, I don't know uh, exactly where they have their origins. Again, I suspect that their origins are the, the, the that their origins are in the pre-Adamic uh, paradigm, in the pre-Adamic world. However, um, these uh, these entities are also associated with um, very heavily associated with abductions, flying yes. saucers, uh, and, and so forth. So. Uh, we know, of course, those who those who are familiar with the the dumbs, the deep underground military bases, might be familiar with the story of Phil Schneider, who seemed to encounter something like these creatures under the ground, very in the very deep reaches of the uh, of the subterranean world. So, uh, we again we have this we have this this strange situation going on, where the where there are these serpentine creatures that seem to be inhabiting the planet with us. And um, so, to answer the question, is it possible that they have been interacting with the human race since the beginning? I think it is not only possible, I think it is probable that the human race has had interaction with these creatures. But I also believe that uh, there may be, and I, we might have talked about this before, I don't remember, but there, 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 may, there may be a correlation between the judgment of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, where where he is consigned to crawl on his belly and eat dust, and the idea that these creatures are consigned to the bowels of the earth, essentially eating dust beneath our feet, and so it, we may be looking at a situation in which these entities are are confined to the to the bowels of the earth. They're confined to the subterranean world. They're not permitted to. Um, uh, to operate on the surface of the earth, or maybe they can't anymore. Maybe their maybe their physiology was changed. Their um, uh, something was changed in their genomes that no longer allows them to exist on the surface of the earth, earth as they once did. That might be part of the judgment that not only befell the serpent in the garden, but his kind, his race, perhaps, or his offspring. So, I do believe that interaction with these entities does happen. Did it happen specifically at the Tower of Babel? Did it happen with Nimrod? I have no idea. I can tell you that the, the, Sumerian, uh, the Sumerian myths talk about an individual named Uana Adapa, who was, who was a sage from the pre-flood world, who, who uh, is, the story goes that he came out of the sea after the great flood. We're in, we're in a post-flood context now. He comes out of the sea, which I find very interesting, emerges out of the sea and begins to reteach humanity some of what was lost before the destruction of the world and the flood in the, in, in the pre-flood world. And, and so he was, by the way, um, depicted as a half-man, half-fish creature. But we know that the uh, that in many cases, in myth and legend, that the descriptions of these beings is is their their physical descriptions are 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 designed to encode information, esoteric information. So when they say that this was a half fish, half man creature, it might not have been a half fish, half man creature. But that physical description is telling us is giving us encrypted information. In other words, th this entity came teaching 
uh, the lost some of the lost knowledge from before the flood when the world was covered in water. And remember that um, that only the life on the land was destroyed. I think it is very po probable uh, that much of the sea life remained during the flood. So, um, and by the way, in the book, The Coming Race by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, the, the Vrilya, this, this serpentine race that this guy encounters, it's a long story, he ends up under the earth in the subterranean world and he encounters this race that call themselves the Vrilya, that are, that are highly advanced creatures. They kind of look like tall gray aliens. If any, any, anyone out there is familiar with the, the ufology and the tall grays that people encounter in abduction scenarios, um, they kind of look like that, but they can fly and they, they communicate telepathically. Well, this race, this advanced race that lives in the bowels of the earth, uh, they claim to be survivors from the world before the flood. So the question is, are there exiles from Atlantis, as they call them, the exiles of Atlantis, as I call them, the, the exiles of Atlantis, are there survivors, hybrid survivors that, that uh, came from the, the illicit activity, the miscegenation of the fallen angels? And uh, I, think that, I think that the answer is yes. And, and the reason why I believe the answer is yes is precisely because of Uwana Adapa, precisely because of the, the, all of this mythology concerning these creatures that seem to have persisted on the earth even going back as far as the time before Adam. And I apologize for the long-winded answer to that, to that very good question. No, no, that was... Um, we need that kind of elucidation. People are seeking to get that kind of guidance and, and direction. And so, no, we appreciate you taking the time to go into detail on these kind of answers. And I... I fully agree with you on, on so many points that you brought up. Um, and I'm actually working on a trilogy called The Great Contest, which begins with the war in heaven. Because um, as I've discovered, uh, Enoch in chapters, in second Enoch, uh, is, in chapter 29 and 30, it pinpoints the day that the rebel angels are cast out of the heavens as being on the second day. And so the timeline that is being laid out, and it also speaks about as the, uh, the beginning of the war in heaven and the iniquity that was found within Lucifer all occurred when Yeshua was revealed as the light of the world and given dominion, uh, command over the hierarchy of the heavenly host. And that's when he becoming jealous where it says in scriptures where the light and the darkness were separated, that this is when the forces of these celestial hierarchies, uh, the angels and the angelic hosts, that they were divided and this war occurred, and then they were cast out on the second day. And so it uh, also affirms, as we are speaking about here, that the rebel angels were cast out and were present here upon the earth prior to the sixth day creation and fall temptation of Adam and Eve and the beguilement of Eve and her impregnation with Cain. And uh, the next aspect of the great contest would be the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent as it plays out. But that most certainly from the time of the second day to the sixth, that they were busy here upon the earth creating these megalithic sites and also involved with the pre-Adamic humans that were um, already here. And it speaks about the, you know, them trying to, in the Anunnaki, in the Sumerian mythology, it, it speaks about them trying to create and to manipulate that particular pre-Adamic human in the best way they could in order to create a slave labor force, a menial um, but most certainly this being didn't have the abilities, the capacities that Adam and Eve um, and all that we could and have accomplished since then. But they did make a type of slave creature out of this pre-Adamic being. And then they also incorporated the teaching of these pagan abominations, the 
victim, blood sacrifice, children sacrifice, the cannibalism, the drinking of blood, all of that was also incorporated into uh, the religions and the reverence of the fallen angels that were taught to the pre-Adamic peoples worldwide. And this is why we see reflected in the ancient religions uh, the worship of the feathered serpent and the they're incorporating the you know, cutting out the still beating hearts and things of that nature, which most certainly the most high um, Yahweh Elohim in the Old Testament, he put a prohibition uh, against such behavior. And we see this contest, this war between the, the pagan fallen angels and that of Yahweh Elohim and his uh, chosen people uh, and Christ, the continuance with the, the war um, with the the Pharisees and the ongoing war now, even today, with the uh, hum most of humanity and the the New World Order elites, as they try to subjugate and push us towards uh, recreating those um, paganized and abominable um, acts of worship and reverence that they were involved in all throughout history. And so, uh, I do absolutely believe that you are correct in your very precise and elaborate description of all the different creatures and the many different occursions and the fact that we've been at war not against flesh and blood but these powers these principalities rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places and so a uh, comment uh yeah i think that um when when talking about when talking about the garden of eden and the beginning of the human race i I absolutely believe, uh, I think it's very rational to believe in a pre-Adamic paradigm. In fact, I would go so far as to say uh, that I think it's irrational not to believe in a pre-Adamic paradigm for a number of reasons. But, but I do also believe that Adam was the first man. I believe that the Bible is unequivocal when it, uh, in, that, in that sense, that Adam, on that point I should say, that Adam was in fact the first human being. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there were other sentient creatures, sentient entities before Adam. You have, of course, the, the question, I think we probably talked about this before, the, 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 the famous question, who did, uh, who did Cain marry right. and who was he afraid of when, right. he was, when he was banished from the family, the family line, when he was banished from the clan, so to speak, of Adam? And uh, this is a simple answer, is that he was afraid of, of Adam's sons, and that he married one of Adam's daughters. Well, he might have married one of Adam's daughters, okay, but I don't believe that he could have been afraid, he would have been afraid of Adam's sons, especially since he was banished mm -hmm. to, to a different land where Adam and his sons were not. They were not, they were simply, he, he was sent away from the, the Adam's family. And so um, he was obviously afraid of something that we might encounter in the place he was being banished to. So that automatically raises a flag in my mind, and I have to ask the question, were there other sentient creatures on the earth that were inhabiting the world outside of the garden? Uh, and, uh, and I think that the, the simplest answer is yes. Um, so... Yes. Then we have to. Then, if you if you unpack that idea further, then you have to ask the question: Well, what became of those people, those creatures? I, I don't believe they were human. I believe they were something other than human. Human beings. See, we 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 sometimes tend to ascribe sentience, consciousness, to the human race. Uh, certainly, certainly, Darwinian science. Uh, ascribes consciousness, sentience to the human race, and and uh, singularly to the human race, when in fact that is a a that's a fallacious, um, it's an erroneous perspective. We ought to understand, reading the Bible even at a very basic level, that conscious beings existed long before the human race um, yes. was created. So. Uh, this this idea of consciousness, this idea of 
sentience. Let's take it further. The idea of civilization and language and tools and building and, and, and everything that is associated with civilization did not originate with us. Right. And it's, a, it's kind of an arrogant position for us to assume that all things sentient started with us and and maybe or maybe started with god and then us or maybe mm -hmm. god and then some angels and then us i think that i think that there was there was civilization and technology and knowledge um around long before the human race and so we have to we have to break ourselves out of that very restrictive humanistic paradigm in which we cannot imagine a world sans the human race without us in it which is uh, again it's a, it's a very arrogant perspective that many people have without even realizing it um, and it causes a lot of confusion because when you when you take a look at anything seriously whether it be history whether it be archaeology whether it be ufology if you take a look at anything, whether it be the occult, you're going to quickly run into other sentients that are not us. And in a very real way, I mean, things that are building um, cities and, you know, uh, impressive cyclopean walls and, and towers and so forth. And then you're going to find that their bones have existed and, and have been discovered and have been secreted away, by the way, which is very much a part of um, the content of our last film, The Unholy Sea, that we talked about in the beginning, <clears throat> in the beginning of this conversation. So um, it's all very interesting. And, and again, just we got to be careful of a humanistic perspective of, of the totality of history. I fully agree. We'll be right back for a second hour. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to ask you about, uh, Timothy, and that's some of the, uh, because of course these megalithic sites and the way that they are aligned to various star constellations, that in my opinion also shows a high degree of intelligence and being able to pull off aligning on the ground, these megalithic sites with the various like the solstices and the equinoxes and also these different star constellations that in my mind most certainly shows that the people that created put these structures into place had a high degree of technology capability and knowledge of the heavens which hunter and gatherers um, pre-atomite humans would not be able to have such knowledge, especially back then when, you know, there's, there's, they, science claims that uh, we were just only involved in at the very meager ends of starting to develop um, technological abilities and capacities. And so I wanted to ask you about the Grand Canyon alignment. And if you had seen uh, just recently, somebody showed how there's structures in the Grand Canyon called even like Isis's temple, um, different, different, given different Egyptian temple names, and they seem to align with the Belt of Orion. And uh, the individuals that have made this, these discoveries are speculating as to whether there are indeed ancient um, temple sites in the Grand Canyon that are related to these particular alignments? Well, we were actually in the Grand Canyon, near the Grand Canyon recently. We were actually in um, um, in the desert southwest in the Four Corners region with uh, our Gen 6 Productions teams, our Gen 6 Productions team, and we met Tom Horn and his team down there. We were filming for episode three of our True Legend series, which is in post-production. Um, and we were actually talking about the, the, the fact that uh, many of these monuments in Monument Valley and in the Valley of the Gods and, and the general southwestern area of the United States, especially the Four Corners region, 
how a lot of these monuments down there have Egyptian names and do seem to be aligned with the stars, uh, with certain constellations. Uh, certainly, even the even the Anasazi Indians, who Tom Horn has done a lot of uh, investigation to the Anasazi Indians, um, and that that's actually part of our our the, the third episode in our series. We're we're dealing with the Anasazi Indians, um, and and Tom Horn is in the film. So uh, even the Anasazi Indians had aligned their uh, um, their villages with the stars, with the heavens. And so being able to, to align your, your, uh, your village or a certain kind of a construction, a temple with the stars requires a very high degree of mathematical precision. Uh, and, 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 and we're talking about a degree of mathematical precision that we were only able to accomplish really after creating computer systems. In fact, it, it, it took us creating computer systems to be able to discover the alignment of a lot of these different ancient locations. And, and you have two things happening. You have, you have, on a more superficial level, you have uh, civilizations such as perhaps the Anasazi that are definitely obviously pre-flood, I mean, I'm sorry, post-flood, that are discovering the remnants of older constructions, constructions which were already aligned with the heavens. And these latecomers would then build on top of these, these in many cases, pre-flood constructions. So that's a dynamic that happens all over the earth. But when we talk about the actual con the pre-flood constructions themselves or the constructions that were built from the ground up aligned with the stars, there's no question that that would have required an intimate knowledge of the heavens. I mean, far beyond just uh, just cosmology, uh, just having an, underst an understanding of the constellations, these people had to have a high degree of mathematical capabilities. I mean, um, and in fact, today there's a, a, a dating process, a method for dating especially megaliths, that's becoming widespread and very popular, and that's gaining credibility very quickly. And it is a method that dates a location based on the configuration of the constellations um, for, every, for any given date in history. In other words, if you, if you look back 7,000 years, let's say, for example, the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Peru, and you and you look through, there's different programs now that you can do this with, and they're very easy to use, um, and they give very accurate information. So if you look back in time, you can find the different periods of time that different constellations might have aligned precisely with a cluster of megalithic constructions in any given area. And this method is, is being used, and it's, and it's, it's, it's becoming apparent that Many, if not most, megalithic constructions around the Earth are directly aligned with certain constellations. And I mean precisely aligned with certain con constellations. So it's the, old, it's the old occult adage, as above, so below. Right. There was, there was uh, a reason why the ancients did this. The, and it, and it, wasn't just, it wasn't just symbolic there was a very real connection that could be established uh, between the earth and the heavens, a very real physical and meta as well as metaphysical connection in which, um, in which properties of the physical world could be altered or accessed. You might call them extra dimensions or what have you, but um, we're dealing with actually, when we talk about metaphysics, when we talk about what people glibly call the spiritual world, what you're really dealing with is a very, very deep level of material science. Because when you get, when you go as deep as you possibly can into the into the uh, scientific exploration of the material world, and you get to the subatomic level and beyond, the distinction, the difference between the physical and the metaphysical becomes obscure. Essentially 
you transition directly from the, the material into the immaterial, from the physical into the spiritual, so to speak. Definitely from the physical into the metaphysical. So uh, there's something, the, the alignment with the stars, again, is, is, isn't, uh, was not simply because they worshipped the constellation of Orion. Therefore, they aligned the, the, the pyramids on the, on the Giza Plateau you know, directly beneath the belt of Orion. That's not why they did it. They did it for a very practical reason that had to do with extremely advanced scientific and meta metaphysical properties. In other words, they were getting something very practical out of the alignment. Yes, um, and tapping into something that we still don't as yet fully understand, but it seems exactly. like the the occultists most certainly... Um, understand more than we do the science behind all that, thus CERN and thus them building on top of already very ancient sites. That's right. Um, even like as you depict in the Unholy Sea with the Vatican taking over some of these um, very ancient sites in South America, building on top of them, and then being able to clandestinely um, to investigate and to dig and do further introspection and also occult and ritualized practice with these particular areas and sites um, and doing this all incognito in their churches and their underground labyrinths and catacombs and things of that nature. Um, That's precisely right. In yeah, fact, and, let me t let me say, Zen, that um, that that narrative of the of the Catholic Church, the cover up of the Catholic Church, where the Catholic Church has absolutely taken control of very specific um, areas on the earth, having to do with megaliths, having to do with underground facilities and so forth, ancient underground facilities and occult power and so forth. There's, it's, 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 it's unquestionable that the, that, the, that the Church of Rome has, has done just that, has occupied those, um, those areas. Um, in the episode, episode three, the one that's under production right now, the one that we're currently working on, we, <laughs> we, we actually, um, and, and this is a this is a probably not supposed to give this much information away yet. But here's here's a here's a teaser for the next episode. We are in Sardinia on the island of Sardinia, which is part of the province, which is a province of Italy, and it's off the western coast of Rome, and uh, it it's uh, it's it's an island be below Corsica, um, and on the island of Sardinia, we interviewed individuals, multiple individuals, who participated themselves, first-hand witnesses, uh, they uncovered, with their own hands, they dug up the bones of giants. Not only giants, in some cases we're, we're dealing with um, um, cyclops being, wow. cyclops giants, and they, they dug them up with their own hands, but they didn't dug them up, they didn't dig them up of their own, um, because they were out looking for, for the bones of giants, they dug them up because they were hired by the municipality of Sardinia, specifically to dig those bones up, the bones of giants. And because they knew they were there. And where do you think the bones went? In every case, I'm, I'm talking every case that we have of from Sardinia, or at least in almost every case, where they're unearthing these the bones of giants. And when I say the bones of giants, we're not talking about NBA basketball players. We're talking about nine to 15 foot giants where do you think the bones went immediately literally from the ground to the interior of a church that's exactly the, the procession the bones came up out of the earth and went into the church the nearest church and and the the entire operation was overseen by priests and mm -hmm. And the bones of giants literally would vanish the next day. I mean, they would, they would, they would un unearth all of these um, these bones, these skulls that are three, four times, five times the size of ours, right? Carrying them between two people, uh, very carefully, uh, so as not to destroy them. They were very interested in preserving these bones, not just not just destroying them, mind you, preserving them, bringing them directly from the ground into the chapel, into the Catholic Church. Uh, the nearest Catholic Church, and and very, and very interestingly, in many cases, there's the Catholic Church already there, mm. boom, right there on 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 the site, 
uh, because of what we just said, that, that the many times Catholic Church, even little chapels, are, are often located right on top of the bones of giants or underground caverns or megalithic constructions and uh, places of occult power. And uh, and so, <laughs> I mean, in the first in the first episode, we're kind of alluding to that. I mean, in the second, yeah, actually, in the in the first episode, we allude to it. In the second episode, we come out and tell you that that uh, the Vatican hasn't been involved in this cover up, and 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 we prove it with historic documents. Actually, in the first episode, then we go to the Vatican in the second episode, and then in the third episode, we're listening to to um, Sardinian Sardinian locals talking about unearthing these bones and carrying them into the church where the priests are overseeing the entire operation. And, and of course, the bones are never seen again. So where do they go? <laughs> I mean, where do they go? Obviously, they were preserving them. They're preserving them. They're very careful to preserve them. In fact, like when they would discover a skull, a giant skull, say three times the size of a skull belonging to a 15-foot-tall giant or a 12-foot-tall giant, um, they would, uh, the, the, uh, um, the way that they were dealing with these with these skeletons was that they would have to pack earth into the parts of the skull that were cracked or broken, and they would have to sort of like um, um, fill in the gaps with clay, and then very carefully place these the, the skulls and the bones onto um, onto uh, whatever boards or whatever they were using to carry them. So they were very intentionally. Uh, very interested in preserving the bones, preserving the skulls, um, and when I say they, I'm talking about the uh, the priests, because that, that that was the end user, so to speak, of these of these uh, of these remains of giants, and and in many cases it, we're, we're dealing with we're dealing with hazmat like situations, men in black type situations, where where uh, the the remains of giants would be discovered by people who were just haphazardly digging uh, in their vineyard or something, and they unearthed, you know, all, the, all of these giants, many of them in some cases. Um, and suddenly somebody would come and demand that everyone stops working and, 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 and vacates the area. And shortly thereafter, uh, um, professional individuals uh, show up, but the authorities show up from the capital, Kajeri, uh, is the name of the capital in, in Sardinia. The authorities show up and shut everything down, right? And then all everything's gone the next day. Everything has been exhumed and is now gone. So, um, so the question is, what in the world are they doing with these bones? And if they just wanted to hide them, they could simply dynamite them, right? Pile them, mm -hmm. uh, collect them. And in some cases, they did collect them in piles and burn them. We know uh, from both the historical accounts and the convent and the uh, more contemporary accounts in Sardinia. They did, in fact. And the reason why they did that was because there were so many of them. That's why they would burn them. There were just so many of them that they would just pile them up and burn them, and then they would take whatever was left and 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 you know throw them to the back of a truck that would come, and it would take take the remains away. But in many cases, um, these things were being preserved very carefully. And we're talking mummies too. We're not just talking skeletons. We're talking mummies. By the way, these giants are wearing necklaces and bracelets. These giants are wearing garments. These are not. Mastodons. These are not giant sloths. These are not dinosaurs. Um, these are the remains of humanoid creatures that not only were wearing, in some cases, jewelry and had gold coins and so forth, um, but but were also surrounded by artifacts that were of gigantic proportion. For example, large plates and forks and utensils that 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 are three times, four times, five times the size of what we would use, obviously fashioned uh, proportionally uh, for their, for, for, by their makers. And um, so it's very fascinating. It is very fascinating. And not only is there, is there the question of the cover-up, uh, the, 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 the even more fascinating question in my mind is what in the world are they doing with the remains of the giants. I mean, they're obviously not on display in a museum. Right. 
So there, there's so in my mind, there's obviously there's the harn there's the uh, there's the search for the occult knowledge. They want the knowledge associated with all of this, and so uh, they want the DNA. I'm sure they're looking for DNA. I'm sure they're they're trying to extract the different strands of DNA belonging to the different races, species, if you will, of of giants and and hybrid creatures. What are they doing with them? We can only guess. I, I mean, we could speculate all day long, but and and I, I'm sure they're also incorporating the remains of these creatures into their occult ceremonies. I think that's a given. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and they're probably being trafficked. In fact, um, I, I can say quite confidently that they are being trafficked. And when I say that, I mean the remains of giants and of other creatures are being trafficked in a in a um, in a black market. Let's call it a deep black market. That's deeper than the market <clears throat> in which a human trafficking is taking place, or the trafficking of drugs. This is an even deeper market. This is an even darker market in which the bones and mummified bodies of giants and, and, and cyclopes and, and uh, other hybrid entities are being bought and sold. Um, by who? By whom is the question? By, and I asked that question in Sardinia, and the answer that I got from, from one of the individuals who dug, dug some of the, a couple of skeletons up himself, 10 feet tall, his response was, he believes, it's, he is of the persuasion that the Vatican and the, and, and the Illuminati, the Masons and the Illuminati are, are trafficking in these, in these, in these bones for, for occult purposes, in, these, in the remains of these giants and these other hybrid creatures. So it's very much an Indiana Jones type situation happening, but not, you know, mm. but not the Ark of the Covenant. And not the Nazis, at least. Right. Not Nazis wearing swastikas, let's put it that way. And so instead of the Ark of the Covenant, picture skeletons, skeletal remains of giants or cyclopes being trafficked and being sought after by, by agents from Rome, by perhaps, uh, perhaps intelligence agencies, by perhaps... Um, individuals who are involved in black budget projects dealing with super soldiers i mean <laughs> it's happening and it's it's uh, it's really bizarre yeah i would say probably the full spectrum of you know the definitely the men in black are involved and that even uh some of the the wars um there's speculation that the 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 focus on Afghanistan and Iraq with the uh, recent wars and the expansion of the war in, uh, of terror and on terrorism in the Middle East, uh, that is to gain access to some of these countries where they have these archaeological and megalithic sites. And, uh, and that even when the invasion first occurred, immediately the museums, the um, places that have all of these archaeological um, discoveries and finds that in many times not even yet cataloged all of that ended up disappearing and um, there was many a uh, cry out to have these places protected but um, I think that those that did give the green light to invade these areas that they also wanted access and so maybe in that way prevented um, them being protected in any way um, and they went in and and took what they wanted and that certainly the elites are um, trading in not only these kind of archaeological but even um, ancient texts like the, the in the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were discovered there was a two entire Aramaic copies of the Book of Enoch Mm -hmm. which were discovered and we don't have access to, but which were affirmed as being part of the discovery and, and other aspects. And we get the fragments, and yet they get the full manuscripts. And so that kind of thing is also uh, involved in going on. And then, you know, the whole Vatican archives and 
the many hundreds and thousands, who knows how many texts and, and ancient books of, over the full history of, of humanity going back who knows how far, um, but that a lot of that material is also protected and kept and stored and only for their eyes are um, privileged to access and study and look into some of that stuff. And um, But the public is kept in the dark and, um, and, and so much, even of what is discovered now, uh, we are not privy to. I heard just recently there was a, d a discovery of 70 metal books uh, that date back to the time of Christ and that uh, have a lot of affirmation as to uh, Christ being the fulfillment as far as the Savior, Messiah, that the Jews were waiting for. And and so there's a lot of stuff that um, is being hoarded, kept secret, and hidden from us. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the encounters with living giants in this day and age, because you also covered this aspect of it, and this is a quite an interesting story, and um, most certainly one that Steve Quell uh, was in confident told about from different aspects, special forces, our military, um, high five-star generals or, you know, different individuals that have that kind of access to that kind of knowledge. Can you tell us of what you know of um, current encounters um, and that these giants are still to this day and age in existence and part of the the fabric of creation. We feature a story in the beginning of our film, The Unholy Sea, episode two of the True Legends documentary film series of a pilot, an AC-130 pilot, active duty AC-130 pilot, who we interviewed, who was called into Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan to pick up some high-value cargo, in other words, confidential cargo. And uh, he and his liftmaster, the liftmaster is the, is the personnel that, that uh, is in charge of operating the lift gate on the AC-130 to load and unload the cargo, flew into Bagram Air Force Base. Uh, I believe it was 2005. And they were met on the tarmac by individuals who, who they referred to thereafter as the babysitters. And the reason why they called them the babysitters was because they were assigned to accompany the cargo to its final destination. And I hear the music coming, so I yeah. can continue this on the other side. On the other side, yeah. We'll be right back, everyone, for final segment. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Uh, Timothy, I'm going to turn it back over to you, but if you would, please provide your website contact where people can go to find uh, the documentaries, the various episodes, and support you in your work. Uh, TrueLegendsTheSeries.com. And uh, also, I wanted to say that um, we are um, we're doing in what we're calling a... VIP Expedition and Conference, True Legends VIP Ex Expedition and Conference to Cusco, Peru in the month of June. So we're going to be going to Cusco, myself, Steve Quayle, and um, we're bringing in Anselm P. Rambla. If, you saw, if, you saw, if you've seen the Unholy Sea, you know who Anselm P. Rambla is. He's a, he's a, um, a international, internationally renowned uh, researcher, explorer, investigator, and uh, he's featured in our film, The Unholy Sea. Um, he made some astounding discoveries in the Cusco region of Peru, specifically in Cusco, in the city of Cusco, in the Cote Cancha. And um, he proved that the underground, um, that the underground uh, system of tunnels, the underground world called the Shinkana by the natives, with the, with the natives in their Quechuan language in Peru exists. He proved it scientifically, so he's going to be accompanying us and uh, we're going to be taking 20 guests on this trip. We are two-thirds full at this point. We have some room left if anybody's interested in going. It is a five-star trip. So that means five-star accommodations, five-star five, five -star dining, and so forth. Um, 
it's going to be a week long in the month of, of June. All the information for that trip is on our website, truelegendstheseries.com. You'll see it right on the front page. Also, if you want to get our films, it's it's all right there on truelegendsseries.com. So anybody who wants to go, I encourage them to, to register as soon as possible. We have some spaces open, um, but like I said, we're about two-thirds full. Um, so that's... Uh, that's some that's something uh, exciting that we're doing in the spring that um, that we still have room for for guests to accompany us. Awesome, fantastic! Uh, if you would please pick up with the the story uh, of the the giants that are with us even in this day and age. Right. The um, so I was talking about the 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 Bagram Air Force. I mean the Bagram military base in Afghanistan. Uh, and the um, the pilot that flew in to pick up some classified, some high-valued cargo. Well, I said he was met at the airport um, at, on the runway by um, by what he refers to as the babysitters because they were assigned to accompany the cargo to its final destination. They were um, high-ranking military officers, um, possibly involved in intelligence. I don't know, but. They were, the cargo was, long story short, the cargo was the body of a giant. It was a 10 to 12 foot giant. Uh, he's not, uh, he wasn't exactly sure if it was 10 or 12, it was somewhere in that range, but he knows exactly how much it weighed. It weighed over a thousand pounds because they had to weigh the cargo before they put it on the AC-130. Uh, actually, it weighed 1,100 pounds, so if you subtract the the um, the, ex the extemporaneous weight uh, the cables and the tarp and so forth. The guy was a thousand pounds and um, very solid. He was very muscular, very solid. He was pale in color, um, and he had uh, very very large hands and feet. Obviously, there were the, the the pilot and some of the other military personnel that were uh, that were around the body of the giant when he landed to pick it up were putting their boots up against the foot of the giant and comparing their feet with with his and and this was a very very large person um and uh, he described it as being in his words it was it was a creature that seemed to have a supernatural origin because it was it was so thick and muscular and strange bizarre that it it seemed to him that it was more than just it, it had more than just physical prowess. It had some kind of supernatural uh, connection. And um, and this and this guy had no idea about uh, anything to do with Genesis six or giants or Steve Quayle or anything like that. I mean, he had never heard of anything like this, and so he referred to it as a big guy. That's what they called it, a big guy and a thousand pound. Even if it's a ten foot tall giant, thousand pounds. That's a big guy so um they uh they picked the the body up and um it was covered in a tarp partially covered in a tarp its head was kind of sticking out its hands were sticking out its feet its feet were wrapped in a canvas like fabric and the giant was loaded onto the ac-130 and they um they flew it to qatar that's where that's where they had to fly the they flew it to qatar and unloaded it in qatar and uh, he he doesn't know for certain, but he heard that it was taken to the United States from Qatar to, um, to, um, um, geez, I just, uh, I just lost it. Um, the Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, Wright Patterson, to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So he was told by some of the Marines in, uh, at the Bagram Air Force Base when he picked up the cargo, when he picked up the body of the giant. He was told that the word is that the giant was killed uh, in a cave in Afghanistan, somewhere in the region, um, certainly in Afghanistan, but somewhere in the, the Bagram region, that, the, uh, that, of course, they were looking for the Taliban at the time, and the Taliban were often held up in caves, and there was a particular cave near a village, and the villagers were bringing food to the mouth of the cave and other items, and so the Marines thought that they were aiding um, and abetting the Taliban who were held up in the cave. So they went in to try and, and find the Taliban in the cave, killed the Taliban in the cave, and instead they encountered 
they encountered this 10 to 12 foot tall thousand pound giant. Um, they told our pilot that they had heard, this is all hearsay, the giant came, the, 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 the testimony of the pilot is firsthand in terms of the, the dead body of the giant that he transported. But the circumstances of the giant's death was all hearsay. So they told him that uh, the giant was uh, f killed the first team, that the first military squadron that, in that engaged with it, and then another team was sent in uh, having full knowledge of the situation that, dis that, that were able to take the giant down. Uh, and then they, they had a helicopter pick it up and drop it off at, at Bagram. So um, this individual, by the way, I know him. I met him here in our studio. He showed me his credentials. He is an active duty pilot. Um, and uh, he is, uh, his story has been corroborated by the sources. So the issue of live giants is a good question because the obvious question associated with live giants is if there's if giants exist why don't we encounter them well it's kind of like the bigfoot if the bigfoot exists why don't we encounter it? The, the the answer is that that, that people do encounter giants um, just not it's not an everyday occurrence and and it doesn't happen in in places like uh, Cleveland Ohio or, or or Detroit or New York City it happens in remote places like Bagram, Afghanistan. It happens in the jungles of, of the Amazon or, or in the Himalayan mountains because, um, remember, there was a mandate by God to Joshua and to, and to Moses to destroy, to annihilate this hybrid race. I think that mandate still stands, actually. Um, and I think that uh, throughout history, um, the human race has been encountering and destroying these hybrids for for I think that they're they're under the impulse uh, of a divine mandate for one, and also because the giants are are not nice guys. These are these are cannibalistic, man-eating um, savages in many cases. The post-flood giants, the pre-flood giants, all indications are that they were very advanced, kind of a different breed. But post-flood giants, many of many post-flood giants, especially the, the contemporary accounts of post-flood giants, depict them as very savage creatures um, th that are uh, very strong and living in very savage conditions, such as the giant in the in the Bagram, in the cave in, in Bagram, Afghanistan, near Bagram, Afghanistan. So we're dealing with um, a situation that is a very akin to the to the Bigfoot uh, phenomenon. And you've got to go to the remote places. By the way, giants are contemporary sightings of giants are often associated with um, ancient underground passageways and caverns and mm. underground cities and so forth. Subterranean world, the subterranean world in general. Um, I also find it interesting that we so we have these very savage, man-eating, flesh-eating giants that have been probably cut off from. Uh, from from civilization, cut off from um, from other giants, maybe you know, living in very primitive conditions, and therefore they're very primitive, savage creatures. But then we also have stories. If we go into the uh, if we go into into some of the stories that uh, that come to us from ufology, we also have instances in which we are encountering giants, ostensibly. Uh, in abduction scenarios and piloting UFOs and associated with uh, associated with with UFO craft, so they don't necessarily have to be savage. Um, there may be there may be a race that is still advanced, still using technology associated with maybe some of these other entities we mentioned before the the draconian serpentine entities. So, in a contemporary sense, uh, we some of these claims from ufology, some of these abduction claims and so forth, um, where people have seen giants in underground bases, for example, uh, may in fact be true, or, or, or at least there may be truth to them. So I don't have any doubt that there are giants still on the earth. And it seems to me that the post-flood race 
of giants. It varies. There's different kinds, a variety of different kinds of giants. Again, we've got even the the cyclops, the cyclopes, uh, the one-eyed giants, all the way to um, giants that are only eight feet tall and nine feet tall. But then also we got 15 foot tall giants that have been reported and and that uh, whose bones have certainly been exhumed. So and and in in recent times we're talking, for example, in the island of Sardinia, bones of giants having been exhumed, mummified bodies of giants wearing clothes. But we're dealing with post flood giants um, exhumed in the last 20 years, in the last 15 years. So. Um, I couldn't tell you where these these entities are. I can tell you that, um, as I said before, the remote places of the Earth is is most likely where the remnants of these of this race exist, because of the of the inherent conflict that they would have with with modern man. Um, in any scenario, I mean, uh, uh, and, and and again, we have to remember that there was a divine mandate from God given to Joshua to annihilate that that race. Um, so hopefully that answers your question to some degree. Yeah, it does. And we appreciate, again, your elaboration on that particular story because it is fascinating. And it um, for those that you know doubt the validity of the Bible and its confirmation of the presence of these beings all throughout the annals of history, uh, the fact that you know they are still being encountered in world is most certainly verification and uh, as to the uh, veracity again of the scriptures um, as the word of God and uh, as also as being truthful and so um, you know it, I think that's a very important story that people should know about um, but I wanted to ask you also about the mythologies, because that's one of the very unique aspects of the work that Steve Quell has done in writing the books that he has written about the giants and uh, the fallen angels, and that's the mythologies and the his relationships with the different uh, Native American indigenous peoples worldwide um, in bringing their stories to print and also in paralleling all of the various accounts worldwide of uh, the stories in connection with the these particular entities. And so can you tell us about um, stories that you have heard as far as the, the mythological connections to the antediluvian sites, these cyclopean uh, constructs, and just the, the, the various you know, mythological accounts some examples, if you would, um, that you could share with us uh, of what you've encountered in well, there are many, travels and have heard. There are many, many stories and legends of giants, uh, both uh, both in more of a contemporary setting, uh, recent history, and going back to the ancients. Uh, Steve did a great job in his book, uh, Genesis 6 Giants, which is basically an encyclopedia of giants and legends of giants. Um, also, true, the book True Legends which our, our, our documentary series, True Legends, is based on Steve's book, True Legends. In fact, our, our series is based primarily on, on two books. It's based on Steve Quayle's True Legends book and on uh, David Flynn's work, um, The uh, uh, Cydonia, Secret Chron Chronicles of Mars. And, uh, but specifically dealing with stories that I've personally encountered while in the field, in these various locations, um, I spent a lot of time in Peru. I, I'm very familiar with some of the giant theology, uh, the giant uh, mythology in Peru, and the uh, what the Incas believed about the giants and the legends that uh, that they told concerning the giants. The Inca believed that uh, that giants once existed in the earth and that they were destroyed in a great flood and that there was a, a race of lesser giants that were lesser in stature and, and in capacity, cap capability, than the giants which were exterminated in the flood, in the Great Flood. So um, the Inca's view, and, and not only the Inca, but, but the, the other tribes too living uh, in the region in, in, under the dominance of the Incan Empire, also 
uh, shared the same views about the Giants. In fact, what I find very interesting is that in Peru, everybody, most people who are familiar with the, with the um, uh, the giant, uh, the the mythos of the of the giants in the United States, uh, are familiar with the the mounds and the mound builders and the fact that yes. in the uh, in the uh, 19th century there were many reports in the newspapers and so forth of people who were discovering bones of giants between nine and 15 feet tall. I should say between really between seven and 15 feet tall. Uh, in these mounds, associated with these mounds, and um, these bones were subsequently um, um, confiscated by by agents of the Smithsonian, the great Smithsonian cover-up, as it is called in the United States. Well, in Peru, the natives used to worship the mounds because they believed that the bones of giants, I should say they knew that the bones of giants in many cases were buried within the mounds. And so the primitive mind of these natives, in the primitive minds of these natives, the giants were turned into mounds. That's why their bones were inside of them. But we know that, in fact, because of what we've discovered here in the United States, that uh, the giants, at least a particular race of giants, had this custom of building these artificial mounds and, 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 and turning and, and, and burying um, uh, and burying their their family members or chieftains or whoever they were inside of these mounds. And so the, the, the Native Americans were encountering the very same thing in South America, which indicates that um, at least, as I said, there, were, there was at least one kind of, of race of giants uh, that, was, that was practicing this, this burial technique. And um, so it wasn't unique to the United States. It was probably ubiquitous in the Americas. In fact, I find some of this evidence also in Sardinia, but that's uh, so. So that's evidence that it might have occurred in Europe also. Um, but uh, so there's all kinds of. Whenever you find megaliths, you always find uh, stories, legends of giants, always associated with megaliths for two reasons. Number one, because the megaliths were discovered by the civilizations such as the Inca. They were not built by the Inca. They were not built. Many of the megaliths by the Aztec or the Maya, um, they were discovered. They were occupied by these later civilizations, the civilizations that discovered them. Um, and they were built upon the ruins of many of these megalithic structures. Um, the, 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 the civilizations that discovered them would actually build their temples and so forth right on top of the megalithic foundation. So, um, but they believed, they attributed the building to giants in many cases. And again, in, in, in the simple minds of, of Native peoples, they couldn't imagine how anything but giants could have built, for example, um, the walls at Ojantay Tambo or the edifices at Pumapunku. So uh, did giants build all the megaliths? I tend to believe that that's too simplistic of an, of an answer. I believe that that in many cases, yes. And in fact, this brings me to an interesting point, which I know we're running out of time. But, but there's an interesting anecdote that um, that I came across, and frankly, in, in David Flynn's work, uh, concerning concerning Cain and giants. And it appears that um, there was a a legend in in Lebanon concerning the construction of Baalbek, which is which is definitely one of the most mind-blowing megalithic sites in the world. Some of the largest, if not the largest, uh, megalithic stones are to be found in Belbeck. And the legends, and, and this was discovered by, um, by a, a French historian uh, who worked in the area for some time and talked to the locals and, and tried to figure out what the, what the traditional uh, history was, the, the history according to the to the local populace concerning Belbeck. And, and what he found out was that legend says that it was it was Cain who built Belbeck, but he, he didn't build it alone. He employed giants to build it. And I find that interesting because um, they they go on to tell him that that was obviously in the pre-flood context, but then in the post-flood context, when Belbeck was destroyed in the flood, um, Nimrod rebuilt it with the help 
of post-flood giants. Mm -hmm. So, so that's 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 a very interesting story that that ties those two dynamics together. So here you have Cain, on one hand, uh, employing giants to build the original foundations of Baalbek, and then you have Nimrod resurrecting the ruins of Baalbek with the help of post-flood giants. So certainly, I believe giants were involved in the building of the temples, of the megalithic sites. Now, and this sort of unlocks, this unlocks a mystery. This unlocks some confusion, I think, that I certainly have had and that many people have had who've gone to these megalithic sites or, or who watch documentaries such as our films that feature these sites. And, and that is this. The mystery is this, that sometimes you encounter these megalithic sites, sometimes, that appear to have been built by giants, but, but when you get inside of them, you can't imagine giants actually moving around or, or passing through the doorways. And you, and you wonder, why would giants build these megalithic edifices, um, but then make the doors so small? So that if they were eight feet tall, they would have to, they would have to squat down and, and bend down to pass beneath them. I mean, you and I wouldn't build a house with a doorway that wasn't large enough for us to, to comfortably pass through it. And that 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 always bothered me. But the answer, I think, is is here. I think the answer is in is in this is in this um, this anecdote from this French historian, um, whose name I would I would. Butcher, I think it's Alouf, uh, is his name, and um, the the fact is that I believe that in many cases it was regular sized people who employed giants to help them build some of these structures. So in some cases, I believe the giants themselves built the structures, and in other cases, perhaps many cases, it was individuals like Cain, or Nimrod, or others who came afterwards, who employed the races of giants who were renowned, especially the Cyclops, for their ability, for their craftsmanship and their, and, 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 and their ability in stone masonry to construct these edifices for them. So you have this duality, you have this, this uh, situation happening on the earth where giants are building edifices for themselves, in some cases, uh, which which directly reflect their own proportions, and giants are building these megalithic cyclopean edifices for others, for normal size people. Um, and I think that uh, that could possibly clear up a lot of confusion in some people's minds. Well, it's an absolutely fascinating subject, and we most certainly appreciate your insight into all of these. Um, subjects, um, and you've been a, a you know, a, a, a helped a lot of people come to the truth on a lot of these issues. Um, when do you foresee the third? You say it's in post production now. It will be the the. It's slated for episode three, which which doesn't have a, a name yet. Does it's untitled at this at this time? Uh, is slated for release in the spring. We're actually working under a a, a tight deadline right now. Um, so unless uh, unless we run into some major problems, it will be released in the spring, probably in April. Um, and again, Tom Horn is involved in our series now on the ground level. Uh, we have some very exciting content dealing with Tom Horn and and um, and uh, Steve Quayle, myself, in the desert southwest. But then also uh, the uh, finds that we do, that we made in Sardinia. Thank you again, Brother Timothy. We will. Pray for your protection and that of your crew and all of the endeavors and all of your work 